So I'm Jamie Allen. I'm the Senior Director of Global Services for Lightbend. I'm going to say type safe a lot tonight because I still haven't been able to convert my brain. And if you're wondering why we're now Lightbend, I just want to really quickly explain that. Um, one thing about type safety is it's something that programmers value. We believe in it, we want it, especially Scala developers. The problem is whenever we're out there talking to executives, the people with money who buy things, they have no idea what type safety is and they don't care. They think we sell fonts. They think we're trying to help them type their emails better. And that's not good for business. And another thing about it is we don't know what the future holds for technology. If we'd renamed ourselves with something like reactive, well then who knows what the future holds? And we don't want to bound what we do based upon what is going on right now. So, you know, Pivotal did this as well. They took Spring Source, you know, whenever they were acquired by VMware, whenever it was spun out and they became Pivotal, they choose a great name that doesn't bound what they do as a business. And that's important. They're not the cloud foundry company. They're not the spring company. They're a company that solves problems. We have the same vision. So hence, Lightbend. We think this, even though this wasn't the reason it was chosen, I feel it means a gravitational pull toward our philosophies, the things we believe in when we're trying to build systems. And this talk is going to be largely about what we believe people should do when they're building systems and how we're trying to enable that so that people aren't making the wrong decisions. So, first of all, I'm going to talk about what I think microservices are, because I think they're very poorly defined. And then secondly, I want to talk about what do we want out of our service architectures, right? After that, I'm going to introduce Logom. This is a Swedish, did I say it correctly? Thank you. We have Swedes. <laughs> this is a team from Speedster, by the way. Did I say that correctly? Speedment. Speedment, I'm sorry. And they're from Stockholm, I think, and they're, they're you know, Swedish, so if I'm, if I'm saying it wrong, they'll let me know. Okay, okay, sorry, Ga Gothenburg. Gothenburg in southern Sweden, so there could be an accent then, you know. <laughs> All right, and then after that, I'll take some questions. Now, I'm going to start off with something I really hate doing. I'm going to quote Gartner Group, right? But they have a very valid point, and that's the idea that we're building systems all wrong for the way we have to deal with data in the present and the future. And this largely has to do with all of the different channels that we're getting data from. So how are we going to sit there and deal with all this new traffic and new channels with our traditional architectures, which are already overwhelmed? And you know, what are we trying to achieve when we build these systems? We want accelerating our development cycles so that people aren't sitting around waiting for other versions of stuff to be released, so that we can release our stuff. We want to reduce the dependency nightmares between our individual services. And then we also want to increase our application throughput. And by increasing the application throughput, I'm not necessarily talking about low latency. I'm talking about dealing with failure. I'm talking about being elastic whenever we have all of this kind of traffic coming at us and being able to scale independent services so that we don't have to throw a whole monolith out there just so that our inventory service could scale, right? Microservices is a really bad term. It says nothing about what they're supposed to do. Now, when you're a company, that's a great idea, right? I just explained that. But whenever you're trying to describe an approach to building systems, this is horrible. Size doesn't matter. It's not about trying to create little services. It's about trying to find a way to separate concerns and then making sure they don't step all over each other. So when I talk about services, and I tweeted this and got into a you know, really nice discussion with some people, I want isolation. That's all I care about, the things that I separate out from my services so that nobody else has to think about them, and they can ask me for them. And I want to do this. Ben Christensen had an amazing talk at microservices.com, I think it was. Um, I highly recommend you see this if you haven't. Ben Christensen, formerly of Netflix, now at Facebook. And he talked all about the nightmares they had when they had a common dependency between multiple services. So think in terms of Guava. If I have anything in my, you know, my, my code that represents a util library or a miscellaneous library or core, something shared between services, and there's a dependency in there on a third party library and all the dependencies they pull in, you are already in a spaghetti code nightmare. It's impossible to upgrade. Anybody have this problem? Oh, 
No, right? Of course not. We all do. And this means that we have to take very extreme approaches to isolation. That means that we can share code within a service. We cannot share code across services. If we, Ben made the point, if we put a client out there that other people call to us through, we are already bounding them to our own dependencies. And that's coupling. We know coupling is bad, but we still do it. So we shouldn't. We want isolation at the API, at the source code, but also at the data. Chris talked about this. I'm going to be saying a lot of things that Chris already talked about, which is great because I can blow through them. He already explained them. But in our data, we want to make sure that our data is completely separated. We only want one view of what an address is. We want it to serve all of the other places that need to know what an address is for a customer. So a customer may retrieve from the address service information about the address and serve it to you in a specific form that you're asking for, for your service. That way, you're not dealing with the complexity. The service is dealing with all of the complexity inside of itself. And this is where we get the bulk heading that is so important. This is a picture of the Titanic from you know, the Wikipedia. Um, and the real problem that the Titanic had was it didn't have isolation between its bulkheads. Water could spill over a compartment bulkhead. And that meant the ship started to tilt downward, which meant more water spilled over other bulkheads until the ship tilted up and down, right? And broke and all that other stuff that was in the movie. But the point is, this is not effective bulkheading. We have to have that isolation between our services. We want resilience and also independence and isolation. This will give you the ability to your teams to work completely independently of one another, right? And not have to care about, I have to rev a new version or something like that. Other people don't care. So long as you're still exposing what they need, they're fine. It's not their problem. And now, with some additional operational complexity, you can be nimble, right? That's what we want to get to. We want realistic data management. I want to tell a story about this. And this is going to tell the story of a microservice before all of this microservice you know, terminology came around. But it, it's a vision of how a large company had to split off functionality from a monolith, a monolithic data store and a monolithic application. I was working at a large cable company. They have 40 million customers out there. And all they do is sit there and say, you know, you've got an account, you've got you know, devices that you can watch your stuff on, and then you've also got you know, what you're allowed to watch. And if you say, I want to watch Game of Thrones, I want to call up, I want to subscribe to Game of Thrones on HBO and be able to watch that, you call in, they update their information in some big monolithic relational database store. That's what they do. And that worked fine for years. It was great until On Demand came along. And On Demand suddenly changed everything. Not suddenly, actually, it was more of a, you know, a time-based thing. At first, there were just a couple things you could watch On Demand. And that wasn't such a big deal. They had this relational data store. It could do the writes, it could do the reads. And the DBA sit there and work really hard trying to make sure it do both really well. But in the end, they couldn't make a way to show entitlements without a complex join. And so they were struggling as on-demand became more and more prevalent, more content was available, more channels were provided. Suddenly people were watching more and more on-demand, and this was killing their ability to serve people at their highest level needs. 7 p.m. on a Friday, that's when everybody wants to watch on-demand. Can't do it. Sorry, we're out. That's a bad thing for your business, right? Nobody wants to stick with a cable company that does that. That's why they go to companies like Netflix, who incidentally use a very microservice-oriented architecture. So in 2011, we were sitting around looking at this monolith, and we said, you know what we should do? We should split the entitlements off. And that means, that in essence, we're taking what was a monolithic data store, because it really wasn't the application that was the problem here. We could scale more instances of the JEE application. The data store was our problem. Consistency was our problem. And so instead, we say, let's make that, that relational store a write-based store. Whenever somebody calls up and says, I want to watch HBO, it's going to write that information into that store. And then on the read side, we're going to cache that information in a completely different data store. OK, now we joke about you know, the three hardest, two hardest problems in computer science are naming things and uh, caching, and then off by one errors, right? Um, but the, the point is, you can do this and actually have a sane architecture. 
what we did was, first of all, we thought, if that store could just emit an event, we get that event, we put it into some, some you know, uh, message queue like Rabbit, and then we consume it on multiple you know, uh, handlers on the back end that all subscribe to the topic. They're just grabbing stuff off and calculating entitlements on the fly and then putting it in that store. The problem becomes time. You don't know that any of those events are necessarily going to happen in that order or that they're not going to get dropped or heck, Rabbit might drop them. Rabbit's not infallible. It happens. So what are you going to do? If that's the case, if you're lucky enough to know that your cache is out of sync, well, then you can rebuild it from scratch. But that costs time and downtime. That's never fun for a business. Instead, what if you just constantly recalculate people's entitlements and you figure out what your, your bucket size is for accounts that you want to handle so you minimize the latency between how often you recalculate. Am I calculating 100,000 people or am I calculating 1,000 per bucket? Right? And then I'm just constantly always recalculating. And in doing so, I don't care if I ever dropped an event in that sequence of events. It doesn't matter. So long as the big monolithic write store received the event, the read store will find out about it eventually. And even better, the read store, we use something called REOC, which is a Dynamo store, which is you know, key value store based. And you can have a ring of them, and it's going to do all the things that Cassandra does, but give you key value semantics. Awesome. Well, the great thing about this, it also gives you sessions. And now one of the hardest problems you have in this scenario is how am I going to delete out accounts when people call and say, I don't want to be a customer of this cable company anymore? One of the hardest problems you're ever going to deal with. Instead, you just let the sessions wash it out. If I don't update that customer within a day, they go away. They get Tombstone. The database handles it in its own way. Not my problem. Not in my code. Easier to deal with. So this was us creating an entitlements service which had an API which would provide you either a protocol buffer view or a JSON-based view of your entitlements by you know, account, by device, by both account and device. And that way, we had these buckets. And yes, that meant duplicated data and duplicated from what was in the right store, that relational store from before. But who cares? That's not my problem. The fact that I get consistency over time and I'm never worried that I will never see this event is how I have a self-healing, resilient system. So getting away from the idea of transactions is a really big deal. If we had sat there and said, well, we need to write to the Oracle store, and we, oops. <laughs> if we wrote to the relational data store, and we wrote to REOC, right, as a single transaction, well, then we're going to have all these semantics that make it extremely hard for us to figure out, did we write to both, and what do we do if we didn't get one of them? To heck with that. Instead of thinking in terms of this idea that I've got a distributed transaction, I allow for the idea that I can compensate for it over time. That's how I can be resilient. And now you can also build systems with domain-specific behavior for when things aren't going your way, instead of trying to wrap it in some at transactional thing, which doesn't work. It's a blunt tool, right? especially in a distributed context. So let's think in terms of getting rid of transactions. Instead, think in terms of compensation instead of this idea of prevention. Kevin Weber is one of my coworkers at Lightbend, and I think it's a really great quote. Consistency is also an anti-pattern. I work with a lot of vendors out there, and one of them says to me, consistency is what we're known for, but you know what? We really need to be able to scale and be available all the time. So we need to be able to put it out on multiple servers and be consistent all the time. And I look at them and I say, that's really hard. And that's because my sales team will not allow me to say things like, that's impossible because of physics, right? It's true. You cannot have consistency and availability. You can have a sliding scale. And you can make choices about how much consistency you want. But you do not want to sit there and say that across multiple machines, I have an absolutely consistent view at all times. And this is where we get into problems with things like data fabrics, right? They sound great. The idea that we're just going to have distributed locks and then we're going to be able to put stuff out in this data fabric and share data across all our services. No. No. That's not ownership. And then you also get into the problem of how you're going to you know, version one service versus another service. Don't do it. Think in terms of ownership, isolation, not shared. So uh, 
Chris did a really great job of talking about CQRS and event sourcing. I want to talk about one more distinction. There's the idea of a command. There's the idea of an event. Commands are what come in. They're the things that tell you what, you, what just happened. Like the person calling in and saying, I want to watch Game of Thrones. The command goes into the Oracle store. The event store is the effect, the things you did as a result of that, right? So that's the separation we have between command sourcing and event sourcing. Command sourcing is a really great thing to use if you ever want to be able to replay failures. So in systems where failure is a really big deal and replaying them is something you want, command sourcing is the sort of thing you need to think about. Event sourcing, on the other hand, is how you rebuild state. Because you don't know that you're going to get the same events if you replay a command at a different time, right? You don't know that. So think in terms of rebuilding state in terms of what you did as a result of the command as opposed to the command itself. We want asynchronous APIs. And right now, the, the thing that we all really want to do is RESTful services. But REST is a synchronous interaction, request, response. Uh, we can do it using asynchronous calls, using things like futures. And we say, that's fantastic. Except, you know, while we may be doing it in a non-blocking fashion, so the, the thread isn't wasted, we still have these ideas of I'm waiting for a response. What if you didn't have to go that route? Yes, at certain gateways, you front things with a RESTful API. But behind that, when we ask for customer information, we say, all right, give me the customer. The customer then goes and aggregates data from multiple other services behind that RESTful API. And those can all be asynchronous and streaming. Wouldn't that be great? That's how we want to build systems in the future. That's the way Lightbend has been thinking about microservices going forward. And uh, the reason I have a postal you know, stamp here is, is the only metaphor I could come up with for the idea of you send something and you walk away kind of thing, right? Somebody may respond to you in some time, but you're not sitting there and worrying about it. You may have some semantics built into your system around this stuff, but don't build them into purely synchronous request response interactions. Now, we also want immutable deployments. How many people have immutable deployments in their you know, existing deployment infrastructure? A couple. This is getting to be a really big deal, especially with containerization. The idea that I can wrap something up and know exactly what configuration I tied in with this deployment footprint, this jar, this war, or whatever. At the same time, I know I've got a, I've got a thumbprint or something that tells me it's exactly this one and nobody can go in and change it, right? Nobody can go in like Wally here and mess around with the individual configuration settings in production and mess with it so you don't know what's on each box. That's going to be the future, being able to deploy these services in an immutable way. We also want to expose only the tip of the iceberg. We want to mask all the complexity of how the fact that I had to get the address from another service was happening behind the scenes. The caller asking for customer information doesn't know or care. I'm just getting the information and bringing it back to you. You don't care about all the ugliness below the water. We want DDD, but it's not a requirement. One thing about that example I told you about already with the cable company was I never once said bounded context. I never once said aggregate root. Those are all you know, great terms for helping you decompose greenfield problems. They can be trickier to think about in a real world where you already have a legacy system, where you're trying to think in terms of, what is my pain? What is the thing I need to fix and deal with right now? It may not map directly to a DDD approach. And more importantly, a lot of people on your team may not have read these books anyway. So who cares? If you call them bounded context aggregate routes, that's great whenever you're having a discussion about using DDD. But if you're not, just think in terms of what your pain point is and how you're splitting things out and how you're going to isolate things. And in essence, you're probably doing it anyway. If you want to read the book, that's the one that Chris was meaning, uh, talking about, Domain Driven Design by Eric Evans. Another one that's much more recent is Implementing D Domain Driven Design by a fellow named Vaughn Burnin. Vaughn is an independent consultant out in Colorado and also a really big Scala and Akka advocate. He has a new book out that's even better called Reactive Messaging Patterns Using the Actor Model. And it's a real mouthful, but it's an excellent book. And it also ties in his DDD concepts with Akka. So that's a, it's a great book. I highly recommend it. I should have put it on here. 
And we want this idea of acid V2. The old acid simply doesn't scale. The idea of atomic consistency, isolated, but not the isolated I'm talking about here. You know, that, that's not the way we, and durable, I forgot the D. In this case, we want to be associative and commutative. And by that I just mean, I don't care about order. And I don't care about how I group things. The more I can build systems in this way, and mind you, it doesn't map to every problem. Just like here, I could say that if I add three plus two, it's the same as two plus three, which is the same as five, right? That's great. Grouping and how I did it, the order of it, didn't matter. But then you throw division in there and suddenly it matters an awful lot. Six divided by two is not the same as two divided by six, right? But if we can keep our systems in terms of associative, where grouping doesn't matter, and by that I mean I don't have dependencies on things, where I have to pull something in at a given time, or I don't have commutativity, or I do have commutativity, where order doesn't matter, then I have a linearly scalable system. As an example, a really well-known you know, consumer electronics manufacturer in Cupertino, they have you know, devices, and those devices, sometimes things go wrong on them, right? And that means that you're asked, hey, do you want to do something about this? And you say yes or no. If you said yes, that something gets sent back to this company, and then it goes into Kafka, and then they've got to you know, run it through some transformations and put it into Cassandra. Awesome. And they said, well, hey, uh, you know, uh, can we do this using your platform? We said, yeah, you know, why not? Who cares? That's easy. But does order matter? No. It doesn't matter what order these reports come in. Is there any dependency on any others? No. Well, then you're having this great solution where you don't even have to worry about things like clustering because you can just scale up nodes based upon how much traffic is coming through. Linearly scalable. Where every node you add, you're handling that much more traffic. Awesome. Simple. Because we don't want complexity, right? And then idempotent, by that I'm talking about the idea that if I repeat something multiple times, I get the same result. That can be tricky in the face of side effects. Side effects are always exemplified by the idea of logging, right? Whenever I log, the timestamp is different. Okay, yeah, that was a side effect, and everybody you know, kind of rolls their eyes. But think of it in terms of everything else you're doing. If there's even one thing that's slightly different, you're not idempotent, right? And then distributed, being able to have multiple nodes up and running doing this work so there's no one single point of failure. This is how we scale systems. This is how we are elastic. This is how we are resilient. So we will have additional operational complexity for our DevOps teams, our operations teams, our people who are making sure stuff are running, even if that's us. And the reason for that is we're going to be pushing more individual services that are out there with their own databases running completely independent of each other. That does mean a little more work for these people. They should be happy. They'll have jobs. We'll have jobs. Somebody's got to make sure this stuff runs. But the point is, by doing so, we've scaled our teams. We've scaled our code. We've scaled our data. And now we don't have dependencies. We have isolation. It does come with some cost. It's not free. But that isn't the worst cost to pay. The worst cost to pay is how you're going to refactor Guava out of 500 services whenever you want to rev one version. That's going to be your real pain. So what is Logom? You know, when we came out with Logom, there was a really big debate about what we should call it. And of course, you know, uh, it has the word lag in it. If you're, you know. <laughs> from you know, an English background, and that doesn't sound particularly good for any kind of service you want to deploy. But we didn't care. We said, you know what, we really like the name because of what it espouses in Swedish. The idea of something being just right, right? Just the right amount. We're not saying that this is going to be small or big or anything other than it's going to be just right. And so we went with it. You know, people laughed a little bit when it came out, but you know, most people have kind of gotten over it now. Um, and then we came out with a Java API, not Scala. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One of the more fundamental reasons is the idea of what we went through when we, we purchased Play 2, right? That wasn't something we built. And then we purchased Spray. And in both cases, we had to take them and make them have a Java API. And that was hard. It wasn't something you could just bolt something in front of. And as a result, the experience for Java developers was substandard. 
At this point, we finally feel Play 2 from a Java API has equivalent semantics to the Scala API. Finally, but it's been four years. And we're not a big company. We don't have tons of people to throw at this problem. And that's why you sit there and say, well, Play has global state that needs to be you know, taken out. So you can't have two Play servers running in the same class loader as if you should, right? Nonetheless, these are things that we want to fix. They aren't the highest priority. That's how things go. With Logom, we had a couple of choices to make. We could put a Scala API on front of it and then try and tailor it for Java later. That hasn't worked so well for us. So why not start with Java and bolt Scala on later? But we have a couple other problems as a company. This has nothing to do with our, our valuing Scala. A lot of our customers come to us and say, we really want to use your technologies. We want to use the Java API, but there's nothing for us. There's no conference to go to. There's no meetup groups talking about how to use Akka from the Java API, right? Nobody does this. It's not cool. Well, we need to do that for these people. When 50% of your customer base is out there using Akka from the Java API, as painful as it is, think about it. Every message that you send, one line of code in Scala, is 50 to 100 lines of code in Java. <laughs> when I teach Fast Track 2's Akka with Scala, it's two days. When I teach it with Java, it's three, just because of the typing. I'm not making this up. It's hard. That said, there's a lot of people doing it, right? And these are also people who are, uh, more traditional in their approaches. And when you talk to Scala developers, they are likely to adopt things quicker, adopt new ideas, like the approaches Chris is talking about. Well, the Java side, not so much. They're getting pulled in, whether they like it or not, by Spark. The people who said, I'm not going to do Scala, they're doing Scala now, because they know there's a fundamental difference in the experience when you're using Spark from Scala as opposed to Java, especially whenever you're doing anything through a REPL session. Right? You can't do that from Java. All you can do is have batch jobs. So this is starting to shift. But in the meantime, we wanted to put this out there, A, to let Java people know we care. Yeah, it's true. B, because they need the most help. Right? They need an experience that helps them build these kind of systems. And then C, it does help us because it's harder to do the Scala one first and then do Java later. So you know, a little give and take there. And Logom has four components to it. One is the idea of a service API. I'm going to explain each one of these in more detail shortly. A persistence API, a development environment, and a production environment. So first, let's talk about the service API. You can write synchronous RESTful APIs if you want. That's fine. But we're not going to let you do it easily. We're going to push you toward asynchronous streaming APIs, because we think that's the future. We think that's the way people should build their systems. And we want it to be a first class concept inside of our framework as a result. We think there's a lot higher resilience and you know, elasticity that comes from not blocking on threads. And so we're always going to be pushing that inside of our code, and hopefully yours as well. And a service itself, this is where you get the bounded context in DDD. That doesn't mean that what you build has to conform to Eric Evans or anybody else's idea of what a bounded context is. Like I said, solve your pain. We have the persistence API. And we think that the CRUD store, the create, read, update, delete, is an anti-pattern. We believe that the update and delete are the problem. We think creating is fine. We think reading is fine, but not the UD. And therefore, we're pushing people into the CQRS model. And we have Cassandra already built into Logom so that you can use it as a CQRS write store and a read store with different key, uh, what do they call it, key uh, spaces, key spaces. Thank you. Um, and that gives you none of this baloney. How many people here to work with things like Toplink, Hibernate? Yeah, a few hands go up. Toplink kind of dates me, huh? Uh, but you know the, the idea that we're going to use these object relational mappings, and boy, way back in the you know, 15, 20 years ago, I suffered through a lot of arguments between the poor database administrators who had to sit there and try and figure out how they were going to optimize on the right side and the read side for the system, and how they were going to organize their data versus what we needed to do to organize our domain in our code, in Java, in JEE, and 
even spring later on. This is a really hard problem to solve, and inevitably you end up sitting there and hibernate, rewriting queries and doing all these sessions with your, you know, your database experts, trying to figure out how you can write something that's both performant and not overly complex, and it's really hard to do. So getting rid of the idea of an object relational impedance mismatch is a big deal. But then you can always determine your current state. Chris talked about how you can have snapshots so that you know, every midnight or something like that, you roll up the state that's been accumulated over all this time. And now, you, know, you, you don't have to recalculate everything. This is actually formalized a lot through things like the lambda pattern that Nathan Mars came out with with Storm, right? And the approach that you were going to have your speed layer and your batch layer. Anybody read this big data book that came out a couple years ago? It's a good book. You know? Things have changed, though. We don't need to have those approaches anymore. Now you see people using the Kappa architecture and stuff. People like the Kafka creators with Samza, the gear pump creators at Intel, you know, Spark Streaming, Flink, all of which, except Flink sort of, are built with Scala. Um, anyway, so, and you can always replay that state, right? That's fantastic. So you don't have the idea that I have a, a single view of my, my state right now, right? I always know what happened that led me here. And that's important. You can always replay that. Um, let's see, we have our persistent entity, that can be an aggregate root, if anybody cares. But if you're reading the documentation, you will see this inside the Logom documentation. And if you really want to use a CRUD database behind it, you can. I mean, we're not sitting there and saying, this is the only way to build things. Well, yeah, we are. But we are, we're saying if you need to do it that way, you're just going to have to go through us to get to it, right? Because this is the way we think systems should be built. Now, the thing I'm actually super excited about is sounds like the lamest part of it, and that's the development experience. How many people enjoy building RESTful services on the JVM? You're lying. <laughs> it stinks. It's horrible. It's no fun. You got to sit there and write your code. You wore it up. Then you got to put it somewhere for Tomcat or Jetty. Maybe it gets redeployed through something like JRebel, right? But either way, it's just not a fun experience. It's no fun at all. What if, just like in Play, you know, Play was optimized for the user experience such that if you had a web interface, you could just refresh your browser. It re, you know, compiled your code, showed you the errors in the browser, right? Saved you all this time of taking the war and moving it into the right place inside the, the container. I mean, all that stuff just stinks. Play took it away. We're doing that now for the microservice. And that does mean you're going to have to use SBT. I'm sorry. All right. It's an unfortunate. We, we had so many discussions inside the company about how we were going to make this work for Maven. And we could, but we would never have this development experience. And that's the unfortunate thing about this. We don't want to be a build company. We want SBT to be awesome. But the reason is we're depending on it to make things like play and log on you know, fun, relatively fun. Right? So you sit there and you change an endpoint. You change some code. You save it. It automatically redeploys that in your development environment for testing. You don't have to do any of that. And that's including multiple services all aggregated as a single grouping. That's amazing. So, and it provides you an in-memory you know, Cassandra to run with and play with. You know, it's got a service locator, which is enabling communications between these services, defining the, you know, the the physical locations and the ports and everything so they can be called. It's also got a service gateway which is managing the proxying out to all of them. And that overload mode for being able to redeploy quickly. This is the fun stuff. As fun as any of this is ever going to be anyway. I'll be the first to admit. And then of course there's the production environment. And this is something that we have made part of our paid thing. And that doesn't mean you have to use our tools to do it. You can use other tools. There are plenty of them out there. But we're wrapping things for simplicity. First of all, we have our idea of conductor. Conductor is an orchestrator like Kubernetes. If you're going to run three instances of your order entry service or something like that, well, how are you going to make sure that gets deployed across your footprint? And how are you going to make sure that if one of those nodes splits off because of a network split or has a disk failure or something, goes away, how are you going to make sure a third comes up somewhere else? That's the sort of thing Conductor does, but it does it with a peer-to-peer -peer gossiping protocol like Cassandra, like React, instead of the idea of Zookeeper underneath. 
because Zookeeper does have a single point of failure built into it in its configuration, where it has to get it from one place. That is not a resilient solution. And let's face it, Zookeeper's everywhere, right? It is. We also have something inside of it we call split brain resolver, where as an application, you can define what happens when the network splits. Anybody ever seen a network split? That happens quite a bit, actually. I worked at Juniper for a bit. That's kind of fun. <laughs> and they only tell you something. When they do, and zookeepers around, you've got the idea of a majority quorum, right? If I've got nine nodes out there in my zookeeper cluster, say I've got five in one part of the split and four in the other. The four go down, the five stay up. That's great. We need that. We can't have them both staying up, accepting requests, and, you know, getting into a place where they can't merge where they are. Right? That's the problem that nobody can solve. So instead, what happens if you have a 3-3-3 three, three, three split? What does Zookeeper do? Down. Right? Because you only had one policy. In a split brain resolver, you have four. You can choose whether you want it to be oldest node in the cluster dictates which part of the cluster stays up. You can have a referee node where you're dictating specifically only one. Depends. Different applications have different domain-specific reasons for why they want these specific semantics. Quorum-based, majority-based, there's four different ways to choose it. And you can do it for each application. Um, we have monitoring. We didn't do monitoring really well at first. I don't know if anybody remembers TypeSafe Monitor console back in, you know, four years ago. Yeah, we learned a really valuable lesson about that. A, we're not really good at UI design. But B, we learned something about actors. If you're going to create millions of them, it's really hard to capture all the information about every one of their mailboxes. It doesn't scale. So instead, monitoring now is about, what do you want to watch? OK, turn that on. And you just choose how much of a price you want this monitoring to cost you. Right? That's a big deal. Um, and then the idea of scaling it out there. Having a single command to say, put it out there. Three instances of my inventory service. Done all taken care of for you. So you don't have to sit there and write all these scripts and maintain a proprietary pipeline of work to get stuff out there. So everything we've done is orthogonal to the actual framework itself. The idea being, yes, you can do this on your own. But if you want to use Kubernetes, good luck. A, Zookeeper. B, good luck using etcd, right? All the tools that you have to wrap around Kubernetes to make this thing work. And then there's always the question of, is it so awesome why is Google only sort of using this thing yet, right? They're not really using it themselves. Hopefully, as Eric Brewer pointed out, they're going to move in that direction because that'll help harden the experience for everybody around Kubernetes. That has to happen. Kubernetes is an important tool, right? It's the open source one. Ours is part of our platform. So test locally and then just push it to production. Very simple. Launch multiple instances with a single command. Sounds great, right? I'm going to show you an example as soon as I finish this. But first, I want to show you links. Um, there's the project site itself. Right now, it's under lightben.com slash logom. And then there's the GitHub repo, github.com slash logom. Um, and underneath that logom, uh, not repo, but group name, whatever you call it, in GitHub, there's also the project that I'm going to show you called Chirper. And you can just you know, clone the project and run SPT and run it locally. It works. I know, because I did it last night. And then there's the documentation itself, which you can find a link to through the Logom site. But either way, that explains all of the philosophy we're espousing here. Logom is about philosophy. It's not so much about technology. Our belief of how these systems should be architected. So um, real quickly here. Uh, so I'm going to burn your eyeballs for a second here. And I'm going to show you SBT. An SBT, build.sbt, showing you how a project is aggregated. Right? And in this case, I'm just saying that I've got some organization. And I'm going to have a whole bunch of services inside of here. And yes, I had to define a Scala version for a Java project. That's SBT for you. Uh, anyway, I define all of these different services, and I say their dependencies between them. But once I've done that, now all I have to do to to, wait, where, can everybody see this? Um, the beautiful thing about this is I just, you know, start SBT. That'll be quick. Ha. Huh? 
All right, so eventually it's going to load up the project context. It shouldn't have to get any new dependencies or anything like that. I should be up to date. And now when I say the run all command, it's going to start the embedded Cassandra server. It's going to start up each one of these services independently and in parallel. And it's going to register them. And it's going to allow for proxying of all requests that need to go between the services such that you don't have to do any of the work yourself. So you see here it says the service locator is at localhost 8000. What I care about is where the service gateway is. How am I going to make a request to this overall deployment of a service? And then, uh, warning, no JS detection fail, who cares? Um, eventually it's going to say that I've got all my services started. It's doing this in parallel on a very slow MacBook Air. But now it's out there, right? And you see they have these ports. And every time it redeploys this locally, it's going to be using the same ports, by the way. It's keeping track of this stuff. And now if I want to, I can go to localhost 9000 and pull Chirper up. And it's using a bunch of different services for me to be able to have like a Twitter experience. If you just go and look at the logon page, you can see a video about this. I don't want to sit here and try and create accounts and, and, and you know, show tweets. And so who cares? Big deal, right? But it works. And you can play around with this yourself. And you can see the ideals that we've espoused inside of Logom. So, all right. We may be wrong about this, by the way. Who cares? We can't find out unless we try. That's sort of the attitude that Lightbend has. And so, uh, ooh, here we are at the start. Um, no, who cares? I just had a question slide. Questions. <laughs> Anybody? Yeah. Is it talking HTTP between the different services, or, or is there queuing technology between them? We're doing streaming, actually. In this case, we're using Aka Streams. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, could you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Yeah, good question. Is it using HTTP between these services? No, it's using Aka Streams. In this case, I'm not sure if it's using an HTTP-based stream or if it's using another. I don't know. I haven't looked at myself. So, yeah. Uh, yes, question. Uh, do you have a separation between runtime and platform where you can have the runtime maybe providing um, a way of communication between services on different languages? In the future, let's say you implement a C Sharp API to develop your microservices. So, would you have like a different runtime separated from the platform? So, the question is can I have different services defined that can all be part of this integration layer? I don't know. I don't think so. I think in, in, initially, no. But in time, I could see why we would want to. Right? The idea to define, maybe I've got a drop wizard service over here. Maybe I've got a Node.js service over here. Maybe I've got a .NET one over here. But I can aggregate their deployment. Because Conductor technically can do it. We just don't sit around telling people that Conductor can deploy Postgres and all the other things in the world. Because there's only so many things we can test with right now. So, yeah. Yes. <coughs> We're using Play for our web services simply by ignoring all the other stuff we don't use within Play. Uh, how hard would it be to port to Logom? So the question is, using Play, how hard would it be to port to Logom? Are you a Scala user? Yeah. Probably excruciating. <laughs> <laughs> because of the Java API right now. Oh, okay. yeah. For what it's worth, Logom really is a mask over Play. Logom is a lot of play underneath. The idea is to make an opinionated implementation instead of just saying, here is a web framework. So I think what we need to do is have a migration guide for people who want to move from a play app to a Logom app. So let me rephrase the question then, uh, specifically regarding the, now I'm suddenly forgetting that the term everybody's been using for the journaling. Yeah, CQRS and event, source, event sourcing. So, so if we wanted to do CQRS, but underneath we've got Postgres, that's question number one. And number two, the deployment uh, conveniences that you offer seem to be what we're, we're already doing with AWS and, and Elastic Feedstock and Docker, et cetera. Uh, what do you add on top of that, or, or what yeah. should I know about that? Absolutely, it's a great question. So the first question is, if I'm using Postgres, can I do things like CQRS and event sourcing? And the answer is yes, right? There's no reason you can't. Postgres is ambivalent to how you're actually organizing your data. You could be putting JSON in there, right? Um, 
So yes, absolutely, you could use Postgres with this. How you segregate Postgres, I'm not sure, such that you make sure that you do not have a shared schema, right? Uh, so as long as you can make sure your schemas are independent, you could even have a single Postgres status store, so long as things don't affect each other. But here's the thing, you want a distributed store behind this. And therefore, you have to think in terms of how you're going to make Postgres run data that may be replicated across multiple nodes, which is already a problem I'm sure you have. Um, this is why I tend to use things like you know, DynamoDB type stores. Dynamo stores, as we call them. Cassandra, DynamoDB, React. I love the semantics of distribu distributed data in these cases, right? But they don't do every case really well, like JSON. And, and I also, I love the semantics of transactions. First of all, not distributed, but locally, absolutely. I yeah. Love them. OK. Um, as you move into a microservice world, it's going to get harder. And you can embed this. This is one of the things I talked about in my book, Effective Akka, where if I have an update, in this case, I really only talked about it in reads, but if I had an update that has to go to three different places, right? I can have an actor that represents the context of that particular you know, thing that needs to be done. And it can manage the fact that two out of the three worked. What do I do with the third? Do I retry five times and then you know, fail because it didn't work? Everything has to be bound in both time and space, five times in a minute or something like that, right? Those kind of semantics you can build in there and have a real transaction semantics. Things like the saga pattern, right? If you have that, then you have the ability to withstand all the different kinds of failures and even have a specific behavior for each one, as opposed to the blunt, just roll back, right? The second part of your question was about, you have a tool chain already. We're using AWS, you're using Elastic Beanstalk, you're using Docker. Docker, you can use with this stuff. It, you can wrap in Docker, we don't care. We don't make you use Docker, and to be honest, I'm torn about Docker. That's me. I think that the people who write Docker are make, you know, trying really hard, but a lot of them don't build systems for the enterprise. And they make some mistakes that are questionable around security around versions of things that they pull in. You saw the whole Oracle blow up this week. Well, it actually happened a year ago, where they were pulling in a version of Oracle that wasn't even released yet, and saying that that was the version of Java that everybody should be using in Docker. It's pretty ugly. Um, you know, little things like that. They're trying hard. They'll get better. But right now, it's difficult, right? Containerization probably is the future. Containers, orthogonal. The idea of Elastic Beanstalk, not orthogonal, very relevant. But what we're doing instead is we're merging AWS auto scaling into Conductor, right? And I'm talking about some vaporware right now because it's due out next month. But the idea is that if you have auto scaling turned on, how are you going to scale beyond the footprint you've already defined of multiple images, right? In this case, you have to have Conductor up and running on these images, and you can auto scale and, you know, built into Conductor and not use all these different tools and also not be tied to the Amazon chain. You'll be tied to ours. <laughs> Can I ask one final question? Yes, yes. Sir. Are you going to take any of these conveniences, such as the, the, the deployment model, and port it back to play? It's all, yeah, the question was, is any of this going to go back to play? And all of it is. You can use play with conductor. You can use, play, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it's just, we're building it into Logom's production deployment experience so that you don't have to think about it. But in play, you would have to make it a component external to play. So yes. Questions? There was one more. Uh, was it you? Uh, yeah. I'm not sure if I heard it correctly, but you integrated uh, Spray as well, right? I'm sorry, we did what with Spray? You integrated Spray? As we did. Yeah, yeah. The question was, did we integrate Spray? Yes, we have assimilated Spray. OK. Uh, so the last uh, check-in done to Spray was like, uh, like in the last six months, there, there are only three check-ins we had to spray. Do you think it is abandoned, or uh, do you make some like? No. So the question is, is spray abandoned? No, it's not abandoned. Is it legacy? Yes. So the idea was, we bought spray. You know, Matthias and uh, his his co-founder. Uh, you know, they they had really great ideas, but they were very Scala specific. And we wanted to make this an ACA project. And if you make something an ACA project, it's got to have a level of documentation and productizing and a Java API, which meant it had to be re-architected. That's where ACA HTTP came in. ACA HTTP is now, I would, say, three, I would say, three quarters fully optimized at this point, because it does do the request response now in a fully optimized way. Other semantics, not optimized yet. 
But if you're doing request response semantics, it is as fast as Spray, or just a little slower, actually. So that's great. But Spray is something we have to maintain because we have customers who rely on Spray. They've got legacy applications deployed with it. We will continue to maintain it. It won't die. If you have issues with it, continue to post it on the GitHub. You know, and uh, you know, Aka user group, I think it's more active than Spray user was now. So, yeah. Mike? Um, a lot of what you said, like, we have SOA, but, um, it, does, it does seem like some of the other stuff that you're describing is SOA. Yeah. Uh, and that's fine. I, I have to really like SOA, so it's not a problem. Um, then you cast some aspersions on uh, uh, distributed cache. Yes. Uh, and I'm uh, casting disper as aspersions on distributed cache. Right. And you use the term uh, uh, data fabric. And uh, I'd like to you know, hear more about that. Um, How much can I say without getting in trouble? I don't know. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Pardon? Yeah, right? I, I, I had a slide, by the way, just before, just so I could say this. I had a slide, but I took it out. It was a certain large company that is a steward of Java saying microservices and JEE -E, and showing all the things you can use to make microservices. And it was this is a nightmare, right? It's a whole JEE ecosystem trying to tell you that this is how you build microservices. And I could just see Reza Rachman sitting out there saying, yeah, you know, no. No. So SOA, Mike asked the question, you know, it's it sort of, if I can encapsulate what you said so far, so I don't lose it. SOA, I, I've said a lot about things that resonate a lot with people who remember SOA. And I've cast aspersions toward the whole distributed fabric, data fabric world. Any more? Yeah, and Cassandra essentially provides a lot of that. And you seem to be it without acknowledging that you are, unless I misunderstood. You're right, actually, except, uh, and what he said was, Cassandra's actually doing a lot of that, and that's sort of true. Cassandra is a distributed store with replication semantics that are not lock-based or consistency-based until you specify quorums, right? You have to say, if I've got five nodes in my Cassandra cluster, I want to write to three of them before I say I've got a successful write. I want to read from two of them to make sure I've got a successful read so that I have agreement in the values that I'm getting. And Cassandra will manage that for you, right? But it's about the isolation between services. That Cassandra should never be exposed to anybody else calling in. They should have to go through the microservice front end to get to it. That is the distinction between it and the data fabric. And therefore, you never have shared data views between multiple services where data fabrics tend to live, right? That I'm going to have all this data out there, and everybody can just consume it, and it's always going to be consistent. No. It doesn't work well. People have been trying really hard. Did you guys ever use this? By the way, this is Brian Hanafy over here. He's, the, the, he's a really high-level person at Wells Fargo, and Brian is also the editor for the book that uh, Roland Kuhn and I have been writing called Reactive Design Patterns, if you ask me, he probably deserves his name on the book more than me. And that's because I've sort of fallen off and he's, he's doing a lot of the you know, writing with Roland. So have you guys used the data fabric at your place? We have, not in my world. Okay. Um, in the back end, uh, where they do a lot of um, market pricing they do. Um, my world, I'm front end, server <coughs> facing stuff, we don't. OK. We're using something like you know, uh, Gemfire. You know, I know the Gemfire people. They're awesome, really good engineers, trying to solve an incredibly hard problem. You know, for SOA, I think that uh, a lot of the concepts we have here represented the right way to build systems. SOA wasn't a bad idea; it just wasn't guided well enough. It didn't have enough of the rules around it, say the isolation, right? That we have to restrict how these services were implemented, or at least nobody built them that way. And that's why you saw people out there talking about how you could build SOA with Rails. It's like, oh, God, please. I mean, Rails is great when you want to build something cute. You know, it, it works. You know, you can get something up there like Rap Genius. You know, <laughs> but you know, when you really need to scale, suddenly you've got 300 dinos on Heroku running, and you're paying $30,000 a month as a startup just because that's the only way you could scale. Good luck. Right? So 
Yes. One well, like question. So he uses BT. Does it mean that uh, developers need to learn Scala for SBT? <laughs> so if you're using SBT, do you have to know Scala to use SBT? Yes and no. SBT is better than it was. I'm not saying it's great. I'm just saying it's better than it was. It has a DSL. Yes, if you want to write any custom work inside of SBT, by God, you're going to be writing Scala. Sorry. So <laughs> Well, for the most part, they're sitting there and writing these just descriptors of services. The question is, what does a Logom developer have to know to be able to write uh, an SBT profile for their application? And for the most part, there's actually a DSL <laughs> over the SBT DSL in order to make it accessible for Java developers as much as possible. But unfortunately, that doesn't mean that you get away from the idea that you've got Where are you, Clips? Anybody seen Clips? <laughs> it's on one of my screens somewhere. I don't know where. <laughs> Either way, it's, it's meant to be a DSL that allows you to express things in a much cleaner way than having to get to the low-level SBT things. When you do want to do anything, it's going to be like writing a plugin. Yeah. You're going to have a build.scala, and it's going to be Scala. So. All right, well, uh, any, any more? Uh, yes? <laughs> Using the patterns. So the question is, what are the top five companies using the patterns in Logom? That's a really interesting question. Well, first of all, I don't think anybody's using Logom in production yet. <laughs> but uh, the patterns themselves, the, the ideals. Well, I would say that uh, Comcast is one, and I know because I work there. Uh, so if you were wondering who I was talking about earlier, I guess I just said. Um, I could say that Goldman Sachs is, and they were doing it even before they started moving to our platform. By the way, Goldman Sachs is so invested in Scala now that they're one of the founding people involved with Scala Center, including Nitro. Thank you, Nitro. Uh, including, uh, you know, Verizon. Thank you, Verizon. And uh, also, who's the fourth one? IBM. IBM. How could I forget that? My God. Yeah, IBM, huge. I mean, you know, it's just amazing. It's so exciting to see this much uptake. Goldman has been doing CQRS-based semantics and isolation of services for some time. Um, well, we've been pushing people, but that doesn't mean that everybody always listens to us. And that's OK. I mean, there are realities as a business sometimes that aren't always apparent. And we're not a consulting firm. We don't sit there, and I say that as the head of consulting, right? We're not a team that's going to sit there and come in and work with you for 20 years and never leave. We come in and we look at what you're doing. We tell you things that we think you know, you, we don't like for scalability reasons, single points of failure, all that kind of stuff. But you know, whether you listen to us or not is another matter. Companies that are starting to do more of this right now, Pearson Education. Pearson Education in Denver is now holistically going with this approach. And they're finally, this is amazing. They recently, like about six months ago, gave somebody an award for having a service that didn't go down for six months. It was the first time ever in their organization that they had something with six months uptime. And then another one is Nomura. Nomura Bank in Japan. They have a trading system that's been built with Akka using these principles. It's been up for four years. No downtime. Yeah. And the reason is distributed systems. These semantics allow you to have no one place that's going to fail. They do not allow for the ultimate and low latency, because then you need locality. When you need locality, you're paying a cost in you know, what you're all going to bundle together there to do work. Right? So that's a tricky thing. Did I give five? Uh, yeah. OK. Well, those, those are companies who are big Scala Center uh, groups. The, the, IBM, Verizon, though Verizon is doing a, a, a microservice-based implementation at OnQ, now called Go90, I think, the streaming video thing that they do. And Netflix obviously follows these principles. And Netflix actually uses a lot of Scala and Akka. Atlas, a new thing that they just pushed out a couple months ago, built with Akka. Matter of fact, a guy just left here who was on that team. So. All right, well, thank you. <laughs>